first one is Psalm 80. I think that's on 592. Okay, Psalm 80. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who, is, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will you, your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and plant, planted it. You cleared the ground for you cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade the mighty cedar with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea. It shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your, ha your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At, the re at your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O God, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. The gospel reading is taken from the book of Luke. Luke 3, from verse 1 to 6 page 1029 in the Church Bibles. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Trebetrius the Lysanians, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it as is written in the book of the prophets, the word of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all mankind will see God's salvation. That's the reading of the Lord. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce and invite uh, Nick Walsh from St. Hugh's and he'll be leading um, the word this morning. And I just invite you just to stretch your hand out to him and just pray and ask for the anointing of the Father to be upon him. 
for Jesus, we praise and we glorify you. Thank you for Nick and bringing him here this morning. We give thanks for all you have been doing in his life up until this moment and beyond. And may your word rest on him deeply, Lord. We pray also that you would ready our hearts, Lord, that they would not be hard, but would be like good soil, Lord, ready to receive the seed, which is your word. And we pray that, yeah, we pray, Lord God, Lord Jesus, that you would water that seed in our hearts, that it would bear you fruit. So come, Holy Spirit, have your way with us now. Open our hearts. Speak through your servant, Nick, Lord, that you may be glorified. Amen. Amen. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. Uh, I've been here once before back in February uh, to speak at a men's breakfast on Valentine's Day. My wife was working, so that's why I was able to get away with it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Church of England system, uh, I'm the curate from St. Hugh's, uh, which means this is my first post after ordination uh, and a training post. And I've almost finished. I've got about six months to a year left. And it's wonderful to uh, be here with you this morning to speak on uh, perhaps a familiar passage. Listen to that phrase, a voice calling out in the wilderness. This is how John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, is introduced in the passage read out earlier. Such a brief phrase and so easy to skim over after all, we hear it every Christmas time, don't we? I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, the familiar, familiar, the well-knownness <laughs> of certain Bible passages makes me skin over, skim over them without really taking it in. And this can be one of those passages, as can all the Christmas passages. A voice calling out, in the wilderness. Let's see what the context sets, what light the context shines on this familiar phrase. Circumstances had not been very friendly to the people of Israel. The historical books of the Old Testament end with the rebuilding of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. A triumph tainted with sorrow over all that had been lost. In Ezra chapter 3 verse 12, the writer records, Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple, the first temple that Solomon built, wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this new temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. For though it was wonderful that a new temple had been rebuilt after its demolition, its glory did not meet that of Solomon's temple. Whilst the prophet Malachi closes the final prophetic book of the Hebrew scriptures with a challenge, a judgment, and a promise, reminding all who listen that God's commands are good, that he will not let evil prevail and that hope will come. We read in Malachi's book, the final chapter, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction and with those words the prophetic voice falls silent Psalm 74 verse 9 laments this silence we are given no signs from God no prophets are left and none of us knows how long this will be. And today's reading from Psalm 80 shows us something of the pain and frustration of the people of God as they cry out to God, asking him to restore them as he did in the past, to, to remember his covenant, 
with the people of Israel. Politically, the people of Israel no longer lived in an independent country at the time of John the Baptist. Their country was not ruled by their own sovereign king. Rather, they were a small and insignificant province of a mighty empire, entirely at the mercy of its whims. When the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament narrative closes, Israel is being treated with either apathy or a little bit of respect by the empire, probably because of the influence of people like Daniel and Nehemiah who were close to the kings and emperors. However, this was not going to last forever. First came Alexander the Great, who allowed religious freedom but insisted on Greek culture for every nation of the empire. And Jewish, the Jewish people were so bound up, their culture and their religion, that that had a huge impact on their identity as a people. After Alexander's empire fell, we had the Syrian empire, or the Seleucids, and this empire engaged in a brutal campaign of harassment and oppression on the Jewish people. And this came to a head when a Syrian ruler called Antichius Epiphanes, who believed himself to be God in human form, rose up. Antichius tore up every copy of the Jewish religious text, the Torah. He executed anyone who practiced Jewish religious acts, such as circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, or obeying the dietary laws. And he entered the temple and turned it into a shrine to himself, ordered people to take prostitutes into the Holy of Holies, and slaughtered a pig as part of a religious ceremony in his honor, in the heart of the temple. And it was during this period that a certain group that form a crucial part of the story of Jesus was formed, the Pharisees. The leaders of this group, the Maccabeans, led an armed rebellion and against Antiochus, cleansed the temple and restored God's word and purity to the temple and regained their independence and that, by the way, is the origin of the Jewish feast of Hanukkah, which begins today. And many of the Jews wondered if the Maccabean rulers might be the promised Messiah. But alas, political infighting led to a civil war and the subsequent conquering of Israel by the Romans, who installed the Herod family as puppet rulers of Israel. And over the next few decades and years, a number of charismatic leaders arose claiming to be God's promised Messiah, but all of them met a sticky end. And with the fall of each false Messiah, the people became more and more disillusioned. Now listen again to these words. A voice calling out in the wilderness. Could this be? Is it possible? Has the prophet returned to Israel? Is the prophetic voice back? Is there a prophet in Israel? After 400 years of sorrow and pain and oppression and suffering, has the prophetic voice returned? In Matthew and Luke's account of the gospel, it says that people from Jerusalem, Judea, and the entire region of the Jordan came to listen. Everyone wanted to know whether John the Baptist represented the return of prophecy to Israel or whether he was just another false messiah who would fall. After 400 years of silence, the prophetic voice is back, and everyone wants to know what God has to say. Now, as with his predecessors, the prophets of old, John isn't concerned about making the people happy, about comforting them after all that has taken place, or explaining God's prophetic actions. 
John has a mission, and that takes priority over everything else, including his own life, as we see later on. John's mission is to prepare the people for what God is going to do, to point to what is to come, to help them to know what is required and to count the cost. He is proclaiming a message that is simple. The Lord is coming. That Messiah that you've waited for years and years and years is coming. Prepare the way for him. And here is how. And the core of John's message is repent. Turn from the things that are not of God. Turn from the things that cause that prophetic silence in the first place. Acknowledge that which is out of step with God in your life. And John uses baptism as a symbol. The people are called to wash themselves of the spiritual dust and dirt that clings to them. But John says just going for the washing isn't enough. You need to change your behavior. It's no good washing yourself clean and then launching yourself into the mud again. And John also responds to one of the objections that is so often made that he heard, we are Abraham's children. We have the covenant. Why should we be baptized? Why should we repent? People thought they could uh, get right, get by, based on what they had come to in the past, what they had come from. But that's not the message that John has, uh, God has given John. You can't rely on what's gone before. No matter how good is it, you need to constantly be listening to and following God. And John's preaching hits a nerve and the crowds gather to ask questions and to be baptized. Luke's account of the gospel records some of the groups present that John engages with, which gives us a glimpse into the nature of his message. The crowd that includes the religious elite. But it also includes regular Jews. And it also includes tax collectors people who were considered to be traitors, scum, vile sinners according to the culture of the day. Tax collectors were Jews who had, in public opinion, put wealth and privilege above their own identity and were working for the hated Romans. They were unwanted. Also there were the unclean, the hated, and the despised. And in the mix were soldiers, Gentiles, and pagans, the very representation of occupation and oppression. What does John do? Does he welcome the religious elite and the respectable and tell the tax collectors and soldiers that it's too late, that they're damned and to go away? No, he does precisely the opposite. He invites everyone, religious elite, ordinary people, and the despised and unwanted, all of them, to come and repent and be baptized, to join in and become part of what God is doing. And this is one of the marks of the good news that John is proclaiming. The Lord for whom he is preparing the way opens his arms and welcomes all to come, not just the great and the good, but everyone. And there is but one entry requirement, repentance. What should we do, replies the crowd? What should we do to prepare the way for the Lord? And John's response is simple, yet world-changing, and totally relevant as we enter what has sadly for many become a season of consumerism and greed. John's response be generous. Do not hoard what you have. Do not cheat. Collect only what you are commanded and need. Do not abuse your power and strength or your position. Be satisfied with what you have. Do what is right. 
not what everyone else does. These prophetic charges aren't a rallying cry to throw off the adventure, the oppressors and invaders as the Maccabeans and the previous messiahs had. They're not a rousing call to do great and heroic acts, not a surefire way of gaining wealth and blessings and doing the miraculous. No, they are the much harder charge to serve God in day-to-day life, to do good in secret, to follow God in the mundane, the normal, the daily grind. And after hearing John's message, the people start wondering, could he be the Messiah, the promised hope for Israel? No, is John's answer. I'm the messenger, the forerunner. I baptize you only as a symbol, a preparation for what is to come. But the Lord is coming. He will bring the kingdom of God. He will baptize you with fire, with the Holy Spirit. He will wash you inside and cleanse you inside and out. He will give you a new heart, a heart of flesh, as Ezekiel promises. He will fulfill the great promises of the prophets. He will cleanse you of your sins. He will restore the fortunes of Israel and open the covenant to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. He will bring justice and mercy. He will change everything. And just a few verses later, the one for whom John speaks arrives. And John the Baptist steps back to make make way on the stage, to make way for Jesus as Nazareth, the one of whom John spoke. It is Jesus who comes to baptize us with the Holy Spirit, to give us the strength and the desire and the ability to live according to God's word. It is Jesus who shows us what it's like to do all those things that John calls people to do. To not use his power for his own gain, despite being God the Son in human form. To be generous, to open his arms and welcome everyone. To do what is right, not what is popular or profitable. To fulfill God's law and make a way for everyone not just the religious elite or the special people, but everyone to come to God and receive healing and restoration and a new life. After 400 years of silence, a voice cries out in the wilderness. God's rescue plan is back at the forefront though he was always at work in the background, as he so often is in our lives. God is back on the scene. His rescue plan is initiated. In the coming of Jesus Christ that we celebrate this Advent and Christmas season, God's rescue plan is seen. And it comes in a totally unexpected manner. But boy, is it glorious. Amen.